a certain pastor made this observation about fathers. He said during a recent little league game in which my son was playing, I made an interesting observation. When a child got a hit or made a catch, for the most part, it was the women who was cheering in the crowd. He said, I was amazed that most men sat there silently. However, when I began to take serious notice of this seemingly odd behavior, I found that the men were cheering as well. But you had to know where and how to spot. The fathers spoke and cheered with their eyes. Now, admittedly, women, I guess you could say amen to this, men are the weaker sex when it comes to effective communication. We tend to hide our feelings. We tend to communicate differently. Yet when it comes to their children, Men possess a marvelous means of communication through their eyes with their children. That their children long to read. We see it in the eyes of our fathers. You know, uh, when people used to go to church years ago, People, uh, if families are going in, I believe, Mama, you told me one time y'all went to church and all your daddy had to do was give you a pretty bad look and you'd behave. And uh, that, that's the way it was with the old people. I mean, all they had to do was give you that look. In other words, to say, you're going to get a whooping when you get to the house. So the youngins, they quit their misbehaving. Uh, you know, while men have been able to hide their emotions through a rough exterior, there's something about the children of fathers that melt even the thickest of ice sculpture and tears. When it comes to his children, a man cannot keep his emotions away from his eyes. I wonder how captivated Adam's heart was to see a miniature version of himself. And who could imagine the sparkle in Abraham's eyes finally to see the promised son Isaac. A father's heart may hold many a secret, but his eyes are a window into his private world of emotions. You know, a man may try to hide his inner thoughts, but his eyes will always give him away. They confess his pride, expose his lust, reveal his greed, offer his disappointment, display his affection. In fact, a man's eyes cast a reflection of who he is really, who he is really on the inside. A man's eyes hold much mystery and meaning worth pondering. I want us to consider for just a few moments in a father's eyes on this Father's Day. First of all, in a father's eyes, we see our potential. Now we all know the story there of the prodigal son in Luke 15. It's been preached countless times through the years and you could probably take it in two or three different ways. But what we essentially see there in Luke 15, when the prodigal son wandered off, made a mess of his life, you know, you can only imagine that when he come to his senses there in the pig pen, and he said, well, I, I could have it a lot better at home, even if I'm a servant. 
I'd have it far better being a servant than here in this pig pen. Well, you could only imagine his embarrassment as he come home with his tail tucked between his legs. However, an interesting sight greeted him. When he was a great way off, his father saw him. Now that word saw, look at that for just a minute, carries a greater idea than just to look at it. You know, we say, well, I saw him, or as the old, some of the old mountain people used to say, I see it. <laughs> but it means, it, it means more than just to look at it. He meant he gazed with wide open eyes. If that's something remarkable. Now only a father, I don't I'm not a father, probably never will be. Now only a father could understand this. To have a son that had squandered his entire inheritance, and the father knew he was going to do this when he went off and asked for money, but he gave it to him anyway. And only a father could gaze longingly at the prodigal son in whom he still loved. You know, our children can do a lot to disappoint parents. I've seen it through the years. I've seen, I've seen, you know, some children just downright use their parents. But you know. <clears throat> What can never be stamped out in my mind is that the parents still love even the wayward prodigal children. And there's no greater picture, and this is a picture of God the Father, and the prodigal is the son or the daughter, the Christian, that has gone off and is backslidden in the far country. But in spite of everything, in spite of, of uh, how we disappoint God, how we fail God, He still is looking for the wayward children, seeking that sheep gone astray. In his father's eyes, the son found someone who still believed in him and could see only the best of his son. You know, fathers can be guilty <coughs> of trying to live their lives through their children. They're, they're guilty a lot of times of making them, you know, uh, into what they never could be. Uh, they, uh, you know, that they try to live their lives through their children simply because they see the potential, but forget to let it come naturally. You, you can't make children uh, do. Now, uh, you, you, sometimes you, 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 have to let them, you have to let them come around. And this is what the prodigal son did. However, if a father would hope to foster and encourage the potential of his children's lives in his eyes, they should find a kaleidoscope of hopes and dreams for his children. Now what made heroes of faith out of many characters in Scripture was the fact they dared to get close enough to the Heavenly Father's eyes and discover things about themselves only that he knew. In a home in Manchester, England, there was a wayward son and brother. Uh, the mother had died, and the father and his family were heart stricken with grief over the humanly hopeless and helpless son. Time and time again, they coaxed him, they reprimanded him, they threatened him all to no avail. 
And one morning the son came home after a dread debauchery. And that night the distracted father appealed to the impatient family. After consulting each woman, he found the unanimous verdict to be expulsion, kick him out, let him go. The father then turned to his son and had said, Henry, your sisters say you should be put out of the house. Your brothers say that you should be put out. Then the father said, My son, <coughs> I will never put you out of the house. And these loving words of the father woke up the son's slumbering soul. He was reformed. He was converted to sin. The Savior and became the mightily used Reverend Henry Morehouse of Manchester. Well, first of all, in the Father's eyes, we see our potential. Secondly, in the Father's eyes, we see our power. Now, in Judges 13, long before Samson was born, we all know who Samson was, the great judge of Israel, a mighty man, a strong man, that God would use mightily, but yet succumbed to his own lust and to his own sinful appetites, and he failed miserably. But even before uh, Manoah's son was born, he went to the Lord and implored, teach us what we should do unto the child that shall be born. Now, Manoah and his wife lived in the city of called Zorah, and that was between uh, Jerusalem, between Dan and Judah. She had no children. She was barren. And in that day, if you had no children, if you were barren, it was a curse. People looked upon it that way. So the birth of Samson was miraculous, like that of Isaac, like that of Benjamin, like that of Joseph, and even later on, like that of, of Samuel. Before Samson was born, God marked him out. God raised him to be a mighty deliverer of Israel. And before he ever saw his son, Manoah saw the Lord. He went to the Lord. And he asked, what shall we do to teach this child? And you know that ought to be the prayer of every father. To go to the Lord even before you have those children. And implore and beg of the Lord how to raise them. That is the only way, that's the only way you're going to be successful. If you don't start out with the Lord, if you don't go to the Lord, if you don't dedicate those children to the Lord, uh, then, then that's going to be a mistake. Now, you may do all that, and they may turn out wayward. And if they do, that's their choice. We can't make their choices for them. I mean, children are going to rebel. Uh, you know, it's a funny thing in, in a household. Uh, you, you, uh, you, you, have, uh, you have good young ones that mind their parents and they don't rebel, and then you have them that go out and live like the devil. But you, you, you can do all the right things, raise them the best you know how in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and they still may rebel. But I believe they'll come back. I do believe they'll come back. The secret to leading our children to success in life is that we must go before them, get there first. Now what impact would we have today on our world if when our children looked into the eyes of their fathers, they saw captured images the Lord. Therein lies the difference between a father of worth and a father of value. 
The father of worth is only concerned about creating an image in the eyes of his children that he, they could never live up to. But a father of value sets a standard, but with his eyes he leads his children, leads the way for his children to go and achieve the owner's legacy. Now thirdly, in a father's eyes, we see our position. Genesis 27, we know the story there of how uh, Esau was cheated out of his birthright, of how Rebecca and uh, her, her, uh, uh, Jacob uh, schemed to cheat, to trick old man Isaac. He was an old dying man, blind. He was bad faced. And Rebecca said, Well, I think you ought to get the birthright. See, uh, Jacob was her favorite son. Esau was his father's favorite son. By the way, as it worked out and in the ultimate sovereign will of God, it was meant for Jacob to get the birthright and for the seed of the nation to go through Jacob. But uh, we see there uh, as uh, after uh, 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 Isaac was tricked and Esau comes in and he brings his, the daddy his venison which he liked so much and Esau looks into the dimly light eyes of his father with bitter tears he cries bless me even me also O my father hath thou not reserved a blessing for me now the blessing in that day and time usually fell to the older children the oldest. But he'd been tricked out of it. And he said, son, it's too late. Uh, and, and Isaac realized what had happened. He says, I've already given the blessing to your younger, your, uh, your brother. Uh, and of course, Esau was pretty tore up about that. But more than our possessions, more than our pull in life, our children desperately are crying out for the acceptance, affirmation, and affection of the Father. Whether it be a sporting event, a recital, or, or a church play. You know, uh, many a children are just looking for the approval. They're looking, first of all, to see if their fathers are there. A lot of times they're, they're not there for one reason or another. And then they're looking from the eyes of approval. You know in the Psalm 32 8, I will guide thee with my eye. This supposes great attentiveness on the part of those who are led, great desire to know the will of their guide. See an affectionate child, he will gather his father's will not only merely through his words, but his looks, his tones, and his gestures. You know what? Uh, as I said a minute ago, when the uh, father and all it took and all the things was that was that glare of that look. And you, you knew that you was gonna get in trouble when you got home. But that can also work in a good way. You know, if you get that please look out of your father's eyes. Well, you knew. You knew that you were all right. Uh, you know, the, the Bible uh, seems to be largely constructed on the principle that God would guide his church with his eye. I would instruct thee and teach thee on the way to which thou should go. And the psalmist here, uh, the Lord is the speaker. Our Savior is our instructor. The Lord himself designs to teach his children to walk in the way of integrity in his holy word and, uh, and in the Holy uh, Spirit. I will guide thee with mine eye. The servants take their cue from their master's eye with a nod or a wink is all they require. So we should obey the slightest hints of our master not needing thunderbolts uh, to startle our incorrigible sluggish, but being controlled by whispers and love touches. 
You know, any hope that fathers have of being good fathers is contingent, I believe, on this verse. The, the looks, that look of approval from the father. There was a devoted father who came into the hospital room where his eight-year-old son was dying of an incurable disease. And the child, sensing that he was not going to get well, would ask his father, Daddy, am I going to die? Why, son, are you afraid to die? The child looked up into the eyes of his father and replied, Not if God is like you. So this morning in the Father's eyes, a little poem to close with. He's there for, for you from morn till night. He always has you in his sight. <clears throat> and we all know that he cares and shares. He even listens to our prayers. He's a father ever true. Heir remain close to you. So our, this is this is the day of our fathers, and certainly uh, <coughs> fathers have a lot to live up to uh, today. A lot of responsibility to raise children. Number two or three.